Hello and welcome back and today I'm going to show you guys how to set up the TSH973 for the very first time. Now it's worth highlighting that this video is only going to concentrate on the software side of things. I'm not, you know, I'm going to take for granted that I think you guys know how to put hard drives inside a NAS and I think you guys know how to plug something into the wall. The only other thing I would add is make sure that the device is connected via one of the available LAN connections to either your router that's supplied by your internet service provider or to a switch that's in your network environment that has all of the devices that are on the network connected into it. Just make sure that whatever device you're using, in my case, I'm utilizing a Windows PC today, make sure the device you're using to configure the NAS for the first time is on the same network as the NAS. And that is to say, it's the same environment that shares the same internet connection. And I know that's a caveman way of putting it and not exactly true, but it's just the easiest way to say it. So um, what you need to do is download the tool QFinder Pro. You can download it directly from QNAP. If you look up any NAS device on their environment, I've just come off the back of doing a video about their new QHora Wi-Fi 6 router. And if you go to the product pages and go to the download section, you will be able to find all of the available downloads. Just head into the client center and download the application and install QNAP QFinder Pro. It scans the local area network and finds NAS devices as you can see here. And once you scan, you'll find your NAS here, the TSH7938X. Uh, and then from there, double click it and it opens this tab. Now, one of the things some of you may not already know is that this is a QTS Hero equipped NAS. This utilizes the ZFS file system uh, operating system from QNAP, whereas other devices use um, the ext4 uh, version of QTS. This uses the ZFS and more enterprise grade version. It's one of the main appealing factors of this NAS that's knocking around for about eight to nine hundred quid for this five bay with U2, 10 GBE, SATA SSD bays, and five hard drive bays. It is a, an exceptionally well equipped NAS. Um, and again, I've got another video coming soon where I'm comparing it against another ZFS NAS, the H886, which arrives at nearly double the price of this one. And I want to show you guys that ZFS runs just as well on this uh, comparatively more modest uh, CPU and memory equipped NAS as it does on the big boys that cost so, so, so much more. Stay tuned for that video. But Right now, this is the screen you will see during setup, and it will highlight that you are using a QTS Hero enabled NAS and the name of the NAS up here. If you need to change the languages, head up there and you can change it all appropriately. But for now, we're going to proceed with the installation. So the first screen is going to ask us to add our administrative credentials. These are the credentials we use in order to interact with the NAS as an admin with full access. Later on, you can create lots of sub accounts for all of your either family members or business team and clients, all with their own controls and credentials. But for now, we're creating the admin account. You can name the NAS, which in this case, I'm going to call the H973AX. And that's what the NAS is going to be called on our network. Then we have to add a password. And again, you can add whatever you want and then it will assess the strength of that password. And then from there, click next. Then it will ask us to set our time zone, which is what we're seeing here on screen, or synchronize it with pool.ntp, which is where a lot of systems get the automatic server and internet time worldwide based on your region. Then click next and from here, it will ask you to set an IP. Now bear in mind, this is only going to be for the IP or the network connection that you've connected between the NAS and your local area network. If you're unsure, always leave it at DHCP or a dynamic position on the network. Or if you intend to set this device up with lots of shared drives and lots of users regular, regularly accessing this device over the network or the internet, I strongly recommend a static IP. It ensures that the system's address on the network never changes and therefore there won't be any dropped connections. A dynamic IP will adjust its position on the network 
as devices connect or if the NAS leaves during a reboot and its address can dynamically change over time. And that's only really useful if all the other client devices are dynamic too and all of the shares are dynamic. But generally, most shares will be static. So you have to bear that in mind. But if you're unsure, leave it at dynamic. Next, click the next button and then say what you want the file system or the file services internally to um, be set to. By default, Windows is always ticked, but if you are going to be handling cross-platform migration and management, such as a shared environment that uses Android, Mac, and Windows devices, tick the appropriate ticks, and the system will work considerably better at cross-platform management of file migration with the correct ticks applied. From here, we can see it's asking me to confirm the settings that I've applied. After this, you click apply and then the settings you selected will all be um, created on the system. And from there, we can go ahead to the graphical user interface where we can set up our storage volume. For now, I'm going to click apply and it will warn us that any storage media inside the system will likely be wiped. Bear that in mind if you are migrating between systems, as this will make all the difference. Also bear in mind that you cannot migrate an EXT4 file system from another QNAP onto a ZFS NAS. It will format the whole system. So you will lose data if you do this. So if you press yes here, and you've already got an old OS or data on those disks from another QNAP or another NAS, it is going to be wiped. So be aware of that before you click yes. From this point, the NAS is now going to apply the settings that we've created. It will then reboot in the background. Once it reboots, the system will invite you to log into the NAS. Generally, if you keep this tab open, you won't have to re-enter your login credentials. However, if you close this tab and try to access the NAS again, you will have to use the administrative credentials, and that is until you create sub-accounts along the way. The system will prepare and let you know when it's ready for a reboot. Now those settings have been applied, we can make our way into the QUTS desktop. Enter the login credentials that you created earlier, and then it will make its way into the user interface. The first thing you'll be greeted with is a few helpful guides and hints along the way. They can seem a little bit overwhelming, so I do recommend going along and just getting rid of them like so. If you are new to the world of NAS, these can be really, really helpful. But even if you have the most modicum amount of information about network attached storage or IT experience, the majority of the setup from this point is actually quite intuitive. One area I will touch on though is to do with storage and snapshots. In order to install applications, create accounts, create shared drives and more, you're going to need to make sure you've got the right amount of storage and make sure you've got it set up in the right way. ZFS utilizes a much improved method of having that storage, removing the need for volumes and allowing you to store data directly onto the storage pool. This means that the performance of the data and access on these areas is considerably better than that of ext4 along with the parity too. As you can see here, this five bay device has got three hard drives already pre-installed and I've also installed two sets of SSDs in each of the two tiers of storage. From here, you can go ahead and create the perfect setup for the first time user on the TSH973. Head over to here where you want to create a storage pool. From this storage pool, the system will let you know about the removal of the volume of storage for the improved performance that's available to you on the ZFS file system. Next, you'll need to select the drives that are going into your RAID. So in my case, I'm going to be utilizing three hard drives which are going into the RAID for myself here. As this is three of the five disks inside, I can go ahead and select a RAID uh, tier that's appropriate to that amount of storage. Straight away, we have a RAID 0 if we want to combine all the storage, a RAID 5 if we want one disk of failover. If we'd add more disks, we could take advantage of a RAID 6. But there's also the triple mirror, the idea that one disk is being mirrored across all three disks. So one disk of data on three disks is being constantly read and written to at all times. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to select the RAID 5 option for this video. 
There are, of course, other options exclusive to uh, QUTS and the ZFS file system, such as the triple parity and more. There's lots of options depending on the number of disks you install inside. The SSDs, of course, can be used for raw storage. Alternatively, they can be used as improved caching and background performance upgrades that allow you to leverage the high IOPS and high read and write available to SSDs on both SATA and U2 NVMe on towards the more affordable but slower and larger capacity hard drives. Those U2 bays can also be used for traditional SATA drives, as you can see here. Even though the system has both U2 NVMe storage bays and SATA bays, the U2 storage bays can still support SATA disks. They will just be only available as SATA 6 gigabits per second drives in those bays unless you use U2 disks. Clicking next will ask us if we want to assign SSDs to the storage pool to be used as caching. I'm not going to do that on this occasion, but that is an option you can add later. From here, it will ask you if you want to enable OBRA provisioning where an area of storage on the disks will be utilized in the background for use in, uh, in background operations and improved caching. I'm going to disable it, but you may wish to enable that on larger arrays and it allows the system to partition an area of storage for improved internal performance. Snapshots are when the system will take regular scheduled image snapshots of the overall storage that you can browse through if you need to revert your system to a previous date and version. But bear in mind these do take up space and therefore it's encouraged that if you're going to use snapshots that you reserve an area of space for them. Finally, the alert threshold. This will let you know when a certain amount of percentage of the available space on the storage pool is utilized by a shared folder, a SCSI target, or any app or service, or just general utilization. And the system will alert you when it reaches that threshold, so you can go through and start making space, adding drives, or adding an expansion device. And there you go. It's asking us to confirm the settings we've created, and if we click Create, the system will now build our area of storage pool that we can start interacting with. This can take a few minutes and luckily thanks to the benefits of ZFS, RAID configuration and RAID building as well as RAID re rebuilding and RAID resilvering is considerably faster. Generally 3 10TB drives like this and a RAID 5 to build would take upwards of 8 to 12 hours. On a ZFS file system, due to the removal of the volume for synchronization, it's considerably faster. And we're already at 9 to 14% now in a matter of seconds. And this will be built exceptionally fast. As this gets built, just to end the video, it's worth highlighting that if you want to add applications from the QNAP uh, range of applications, they're all available here in the App Center with lots of apps already available at the click of a button for installation. Just make sure that your storage pool is complete. On top of that, if you want to create sub-users, go ahead and we'll go into more details in my follow-up video. If you want to create users and user groups all with their own user credentials, access to shared folders and more, it can all be done here. Finally, if you want to browse files and folders on the system via the web browser, go into File Station and as the system creates, your new area of storage, which unfortunately is not completed yet, but it's so close, you have the option here to create shared folders. You can go ahead and create a mapped shared folder, or if you go into the storage area, you can go ahead and create a LUN or a SCSI target that can be accessed with the appearance of a localized drive on your system. If you want to go ahead and add cache, make sure the storage area that you're creating is complete, as you can see, it's building now in the background. As it creates these folders, and if you've got enough memory on your 973AX, you can enable inline compression and inline deduplication for more added benefits of QUTS. And if you want to enable cache, go to the cache acceleration tab, click the plus, and at the moment, it's not able to let us do it until that area is completed for our raid, but from here, you can add SSDs. Thank you for so much for watching the video and I hope you guys find it useful. 
There's lots of things you can do with this brand new NAS and certainly take advantage of the benefits of ZFS. And we will be doing both 10 GBE performance testing on this NAS and performance in things like virtual machines, Plex and QVR Elite very, very soon. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys have found this video helpful. And if you have, click like. If you want to learn more, click subscribe and visit the links in the description to learn more about this product, other NASs, and the best place to buy them, span.com. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.